Okay, uh, we're up to question six now on the June 2009 paper uh, for the BY1. Um, this question starts off looking at biological molecules, uh, but it does move on uh, to consider enzymes. Okay, so the examiner has combined uh, uh, carbohydrates with enzymes in a, in a rather neat uh, little question, I think. Um, okay, so to start off with then, we've got uh, two glucose uh, monomers here okay and I'm just highlighting uh, the carbons there that's carbon number one okay um, and from that information there you should know that these are actually uh, alpha glucose molecules because the OH on carbon number one is pointing down okay uh, so the examiner wants us to complete this diagram to show um, how those two glucose monomers uh, react and join together okay uh, so I've uh, uh, drawn out the answer there for you okay and what I've done is that I've joined the two uh, glucose molecules together by a glycosidic bond and uh, I've actually shown there that the uh, water has been released because this is a condensation reaction uh, water is released because um, the two OHs have reacted together if you can see at the top if I draw a, a line around there the OH and the H will react uh, to uh, release water uh, that leaves an oxygen uh, remaining and that then can form the uh, glycosidic bond between the two uh, glucose molecules Okay, so that's the uh, the diagram that you uh, should draw in. Okay, and uh, if we scroll down to uh, the three questions there, it's asking you to name the organic molecule formed. Uh, just to remind you, an organic molecule is anything that contains carbon. Okay, uh, the molecule that's formed in this case is actually maltose, because maltose is a disaccharide formed from the reaction of two alpha glucose molecules. Uh, don't put uh, a disaccharide as an answer there because a disaccharide is just a general term. There are many different types of disaccharide. Uh, so you have to specifically mention their maltose. Moving on to part three. Uh, name the inorganic molecule released during the reaction. Uh, inorganic uh, means anything that does not contain carbon. Uh, so in this case, uh, the molecule that's released is water, that's inorganic, it doesn't contain carbon. And lastly, then, name the type of reaction. Well, because water is released, uh, the reaction is called a condensation reaction. Okay, so there's the, uh, the answers written in. Uh, if we scroll on down then to uh, part B, uh, this is the uh, section now where the examiner links uh, carbohydrates with um, enzymes okay uh, so he's telling you here that there's a bacterium called streptococcus mutagens that produces an enzyme called glycosyl transferase uh, that enzyme then um, catalyzes a reaction uh, which is called a polymerization reaction okay so we'll come to what polymerization is in a moment um, so it polymerizes uh, basically glucose molecules so it adds glucose molecules together all right uh, to form something called a polymer okay so polymers of glucose form part of the plaque on teeth which leads to uh, dental disease uh, so one will assume then that this bacterium streptococcus mutagens um, uh, lives in the mouth uh, there are normal um, bacteria that are found in the mouth this bacterium releases this enzyme and it then catalyzes this uh, plaque formation by joining glucose uh, molecules together. Uh, that's why eating sugary foods is particularly uh, damaging to teeth because it can actually lead to erosion and plaque formation. Um, so a little uh, point to mention um, uh, before we go on then is uh, polymerization because you're asked to describe or uh, state what is polymerization. Um, it's basically the joining together of uh, monomers or subunits to form um, a larger molecule. Okay, uh, so for example, if you look at starch, okay, starch is a, a polymer uh, made up of the monomer alpha glucose. 
Okay, so polymerization occurs when you get monomers being joined together uh, to produce uh, a very large molecule. Uh, another point as well is that uh, polymerization only occurs when the same monomer is being added uh, together. Okay, you can't have different monomers uh, to produce a polymer. Okay. Okay, so I've uh, I've typed in the answer there. Uh, it's uh, the joining together of monomers to form a larger molecule. Okay, if we move on to part two, then uh, this is where we now have to consider some uh, enzyme uh, activity um, uh, stuff. So basically, this uh, this part of the question is looking at a experiment where the activity um, of the enzyme glycosyl transferase, okay, the activity of that enzyme was investigated by the presence of iron sulfate, okay. Uh, so it looks like that iron sulfate is affecting the activity of glycosyl transferase. Now, it's early on in the in the question here, but because the examiner has mentioned that iron sulfate affects the activity of glycosyl transferase you can you can sort of assume at the moment that there's a possibility that iron sulfate is actually an inhibitor of glycosyl transferase because that's what inhibitors do they affect the activity uh, of an enzyme now at this point we can't be a hundred percent sure and we can't really uh, decide at this moment whether iron sulfate is a competitive or non-competitive inhibitor. All right, we don't have enough information at the moment, but that's possibly where this question is going. It may be all about inhibitors, but uh, we won't know for sure really until we uh, uh, progress through the question. Right, we have uh, a table of results here where the investigators have used different concentrations of iron sulfate. Okay, so you've got that column there with iron sulfate concentration. The units are millimolar, okay, and the concentration runs from uh, 0 up to 6 millimolar there. Okay, in the other column then, you actually have the results for the enzyme activity. Uh, this time the examiner's using the unit of micromoles. Okay, micromoles is a millionth of a mole. Okay, um, so the results here actually run from 60 all the way down to 1.2. Now looking at those sets of results, I think there's a clear relationship there between concentration of iron sulfate and the activity of the glycosyl transferase. Okay, if you have zero concentration of iron sulfate, you actually have quite a high activity of the enzyme. It's 60 micromoles. Okay, as the concentration of the iron sulfate increases, uh, the activity of the enzyme decreases. Okay, so there seems to be a rather good relationship there between concentration of iron sulfate and the activity um, of the uh, glycosyl transferase enzyme. Okay, so uh, if we scroll down, then the examiner now wants you to plot that data on a graph uh, using the, uh, the rather small grid that uh, he's placed uh, in the exam paper. Uh, so what I've done, I've actually plotted this graph out, um, which I'm going to show you in a moment. All right, uh, but you need to be able to construct an appropriate scale for this graph, uh, both for the y and the x-axis. Okay, so if I pull up the graph, uh, we can actually look at uh, how I've uh, plotted the graph and how I've constructed the scale. Okay, so there's the graph that I've drawn. Um, as you can see, I've fully labelled uh, the axes there. Okay, along the y-axis, I've got the glycosyl transferase activity, including the units, and along the x, I've got the iron sulfate concentration in millimolar there. Um, you've got to make sure you label your axes the correct way round. Um, you need the iron sulfate concentration on the x-axis because that is the variable you're changing. Okay, you're altering the concentration of the iron sulfate. The glycosyl transferase is what you are measuring, so that goes along the, the y-axis. Now, the, uh, the graph paper grid there is actually a square, and... Um, 
you've got seven squares by seven squares. All right, if I just highlight here that uh, this is a square on the graph paper there. Okay, um, so what I've done is that um, we've actually got a maximum of six millimolar concentration of iron sulfate. All right, so what I've done is for every large square, I've gone up in ones. All right, and that then is a good linear scale along the uh, x-axis. Remember, every graph that you plot, whether in a written paper or in your actual BY3 uh, practical uh, paper, you need to make sure your uh, scale is linear. And what that means is that your uh, scale goes up by equal amounts every time. So in the case of my x-axis, it goes up by one every time. Okay. Uh, if we look at the y-axis now, um, the maximum um, glycosyl transferase activity is 60. Okay, so what I've done here, I've decided to go up uh, every large square to go up by 10. All right, and that gives us a good linear scale again um, for the uh, enzyme activity. Okay. Okay, I've just cleared the editing off that graph now because uh, I want to uh, explain how you actually plot uh, the data on this graph. Um, any graph that you plot, again, whether in a written exam or in your practical exam, has to be plotted very accurately. Okay, you will lose marks if your data points are not plotted accurately. So, um, basically, um, as you can see from the results table, all right. Um, if you look at uh, zero millimolar for the iron sulfate, at that concentration, the activity of the enzyme is 60 micromoles. Now that data point is easy to plot because there is actually a 60 uh, value on the Y scale. Okay, uh, so that one's been plotted fine at the top there. That's uh, that's pretty straightforward. But if we look at the uh, concentration uh, of one millimolar, um, in this case, the enzyme activity is actually 25.2. Okay, now there is no 25.2 um, stated on the Y scale. All we've got is 20 and 30. So 25.2 lies somewhere between 20 and 30. So we have to decide exactly where we plot um, our data point. Now I've put it there. Okay, that's where I've plotted 25.2. So how have I found and decided that that part of the graph is 25.2? Well, if I uh, zoom in, okay, this is uh, an easy way now to plot uh, data on a graph. Um, one large square on the graph there, okay. Uh, we're just interested in the y axis at the moment, okay. So for every large square, um, I've said that that represents 10 micromoles, okay. But what you can find is for every one large square, there's actually five smaller squares within it. So there's one there, two, three, four, and five. So what we've got to do is we've got to try and find out the value of one small square. Okay, now for this graph, that's pretty straightforward to do. It's just a little bit of uh, maths. So if one large square is equal to 10, then each individual small square must have a value of two. Okay, because 2 times 5 is 10. Yeah, so if we go up again, I can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then lastly, 9, 10. All right, so for this graph then, each small square represents 2 uh, micromoles on the y-axis scale. Um, so if we look at my data point um, for 25 Point two, zoom in a little bit more. Have I plotted this uh, data point accurately? Well, let's have a look. Um, so we're at um, 20 for there, if I just show you the scale. 
So we're at 20. Okay, so that line there represents 20. So then the next one is 22. And then the next one again is 24. All right. So my data point now, I've plotted halfway um, through the last uh, or the next uh, small square. All right. So that represents a position there of 25. Now, you won't be expected to be able to accurately point uh, plot the point two. Okay. Um, the size of the, uh, the the cross is so large that it sort of obscures the point two. But I reckon that data point is reasonably plotted. It's halfway between uh, a small square, which represents 25. Okay. Um, so that's how you uh, plot your, your data points. Uh, for this graph, you need to make sure your uh, crosses are quite small and neat. You need to use a sharp pencil, okay, because the examiner will take uh, marks off you if you uh, have a, an untidy or inaccurately plotted uh, graph. Okay, so using that, uh, that method, then, you can actually plot uh, the rest of the data points. Uh, it gets a little bit awkward down uh, towards the end there, where uh, the values uh, are very, very similar. But I've tried as best as I can to accurately plot that data. Okay, so if I zoom right in, you can see that the last two data points um, are slightly different, uh, as they should be. You know, concentration 5 millimolar is 1.6, okay and uh, the 6 millimolar is 1.2. So I think you can clearly see that I've done my best to show that there is a slight difference between those two data points. All right, and that's something that you should be able to do then in, a, in an exam. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, plotting of the graph. That was worth three marks. Um, Okay, so now we can actually go on and look at the next question. Right, um, so part number three then is asking you to use the graph to calculate the concentration of iron sulfate that would decrease the activity of the enzyme by 50%. So if I just pull the graph up again, okay, um, you want to find out the concentration of iron sulfate then, okay, that will reduce the activity of the uh, enzyme by 50%. Well, how do we start doing this? Well, let's look at the top value, okay? The maximum um, activity of the enzyme is 60, okay? So you want to have 50% of 60. All right, so basically a half of 60 is 30. All right, so 30 represents 50% of the enzyme activity. So we now need to figure out what concentration of iron sulfate will give 30, uh, 30 micromoles of uh, enzyme activity. All right, so to do that, we actually need... Um, to draw some lines on the graph. So I'm going to pull up uh, another graph uh, to show you how to do it. Okay, so here's my uh, second graph. And as you can see, um, I've drawn uh, a line now from the 30 micromolar uh, value. And I've drawn a line across to my uh, curve, okay, on the graph. And then I've drawn a line going down uh, to the uh, x-axis, okay? So what that has enabled me to do is to read off the concentration of iron 2 sulfate that would uh, reduce the activity of the enzyme by 50%, okay? Now, in this case, if I zoom in on this uh, part of the graph, okay, um, you can see that despite my best efforts, the line that I've drawn going down to the uh, x-axis is not straight. Can you see that? It's slightly tapering off 
okay now it's not too bad but you want to try and avoid doing that in an exam because it could potentially result in you uh, result in you getting the the wrong answer all right so um, my line is slightly off but it's not too bad so basically the concentration of iron 2 sulfate that causes 50 percent uh, reduction in enzyme activity will be 0.9 uh, millimolar okay so just remember now it goes up in twos so it's one two three four five six seven eight and my line is sort of halfway between um, the one and uh, point eight so I would say that that's uh, uh, point nine uh, the actual examiner will allow a range of values here he'll allow anything from 0 0.7 uh, to 0 0.9 okay so i reckon that my answer should have been ab about 0 0.8 if my line was straight um i should have been point, uh, point 0.8 but it's slightly off but the examiner would allow a maximum of 0 0.9 okay right uh, so before uh, we write the answer in there what i just want to emphasize to you is uh, a little trip a uh, little tip of joining the data points together as you can see from this graph i've drawn um, the data points uh, together by straight lines in your biology exam you don't want to be drawing a line of best fit you want to draw your line uh, basically point to point okay uh, and that'll uh, always give you um, the correct uh, answer there okay um, so let's jot in uh, the answer right I've put in 0 0.9 millimolar okay um, another tip for you uh, whenever you're quoting uh, values uh, that have units you need to put the units in you will lose a mark if you do not put the units in all right so if I just put 0.9 there with no units I would have lost a mark okay so there is the correct answer okay then let's move on to the uh, the next question um, here we have to do a, a, a small calculation uh, you're asked to calculate the percentage by which a three millimolar iron sulfate solution would decrease the activity of the enzyme uh, show your workings uh, so what I want to do is just scroll back up to the uh, the results table okay uh, what we're interested in here is uh, this column here uh, to start with you're asked to calculate um, how much as a percent how much three millimolar has decreased the activity uh, of the enzyme okay so the activity of the enzyme at three millimolar is 5.2 okay um, but what does it mean about percentage decrease? So it, it, we, we've got to actually have another value here in order for us to calculate how much the activity has been decreased. Okay, so we actually want to relate that to the initial um, activity of the enzyme. Okay, so the initial activity was 60 uh, micromoles. Okay, and um, three millimolar of iron sulfate has caused the activity to reduce to 5.2 so what we need to do is use those two values which I'm going to call initial so 60 was the initial um, activity value okay and the 5.2 value there is uh, called the final um, value okay um, so if I scroll back down to the um, uh, question I want to pull up the uh, calculation that we're going to use uh, to do this uh, sum okay um, I've got an equation there at the top uh, that equation is an important one um, it's one that you should commit to memory um, it can be used in a variety of subjects in um, your A-level biology exam it's certainly used in the osmosis section um, if you've read the notes on that 
Um, it'll certainly be used, or and has been used, in a BY2 question on um, insect uh, tracheal systems. Okay, so it is a very, very important equation. And um, even though I've labelled it here percentage decrease, okay, um, the same equation can be used for a percentage increase. It's just that this question is about a percentage decrease, so I've just put that in there. So what the equation is, is final value minus the initial divided by the initial times 100. Okay, um, so my final value, as we've said, was 5.2. The um, initial was 60, and then, of course, divide by the initial there. So it's 5.2 minus 60 divided by 60 will give you minus 0.913. Okay, you then times that by 100 to convert it to a percent. So our answer is minus nine, uh, 91.3%. Now, why has the answer come out as a minus? It's a minus value to signify that the percentage is a decrease. Okay, it's gone from 60 down all the way to 5.2. So that is a decrease of 91.3%. And the minus signifies that it's actually a decrease in percent. Um, if this was a calculation on percentage increase, that value would be a positive value. Okay, so uh, this is the way I like to do it. Okay, um, in the mark scheme, as I'll show you at the end of the question, the examiner has done it slightly differently. All right, and I'll explain uh, more about that when we look at uh, look at the mark scheme. Okay. Let's get rid of that. So uh, in the question then, you do have to write out your workings. Okay, you're normally given one mark um, for your workings out. Uh, so it's two marks in total, one mark for the workings, uh, one mark uh, for the answer. So uh, for the answer there, uh, I would actually just put in 91.3%. Uh, I don't think you need to put the minus in. Um, okay. Okay, so there's the answer, and again, I've put the uh, the units in, uh, which is a percent uh, in this case. Okay, then uh, moving on uh, to the uh, the next question, which is worth three marks. Uh, the two scientists then discovered that the iron sulfate acted as a competitive inhibitor. There we go. So we've got our answer now. Um, earlier on, I was uh, perhaps talking about whether it was a competitive or a non-competitive inhibitor. We didn't know. Now we've been told uh, it's a competitive inhibitor. And the, ask, uh, the question's asking you to describe the mechanism by which the competitive inhibitor decreases the activity of the enzyme. OK, um, so before we, uh, we type the answer in, just a quick refresher on what competitive inhibitors are. They are the inhibitors that bind to the active site. Uh, they have a similar shape uh, to the active site. OK, um, and they actually compete with the substrate uh, for the active site. OK, so hence the term uh, uh, competitive uh, inhibitor. OK, um, OK, then, so let's uh, type this answer in. OK, uh, so the answer I've got there is the competitive inhibitor binds to the active site of the enzyme and prevents the substrate binding to the active site. So no enzyme substrate complexes can be formed. I think that is a, a very, very important thing to put in there. No enzyme substrate complexes can be uh, formed. Um, and also the inhibitor uh, prevents the substrate from binding uh, to the active site. OK, that's quite important as well. And lastly, I've said the competitive inhibitor has a similar shape to the substrate. It's, it's not an identical shape to the substrate. It's uh, it's similar, uh, but not identical. And then I've said that the uh, competitive inhibitor is, is partially complementary in shape to the active site. Again, uh, the competitive inhibitor it isn't fully complementary to the active site, but it does have a region that is complementary to the active site, and that enables it to bind 
uh, and then block uh, the active site. Okay, again, I've got some uh, uh, good diagrams of uh, shapes of inhibitors uh, in the um, notes uh, if you want to have a look at those. Okay, then, uh, moving on uh, to the last uh, question uh, here. It's asking, suggest a possible use for the discoveries made by, uh, I think that's pronounced uh, developer and Musa. Okay. Um, well, if this uh, iron 2 sulfate can actually uh, reduce the activity of an enzyme that causes plaque formation, okay, then it would be a pretty good idea uh, to actually add maybe iron sulfate to toothpaste and have it as a um, plaque preventative uh, toothpaste there. Okay. Okay then, so uh, that's uh, that's the end of uh, question six. Uh, if we have a quick look at the uh, marking scheme, okay. Uh, part A, uh, I think, is pretty straightforward there. Okay. Uh, part B1 is about the um, uh, polymerization there. Okay. Part two is about the graph. You can see you've got to have correct axes there. Uh, iron sulfate concentration on the horizontal, which is the x-axis, uh, both labelled and units given. Okay, without the units, no marks. Uh, suitable scale using at least half available space. That's a that's a rule of thumb there. For any graph that you use, you have to use at least half the available space. Uh, we actually use pretty much all of that graph paper there. Okay, the plot's visible and clear line uh, of correct shape. Okay, um, right, the value, um, as we mentioned earlier, should be 0.9 millimolar. The examiner would have allowed 0.7 to 0.9 uh, millimolar there. Okay, on to this calculation uh, for the percentage decrease. Uh, this is the calculation the examiner has used. Okay, what he's done is he's decided to do it opposite to what I've done. He's decided to take 5.2 away from 60. That gave him 54.8. He then divided it by 60, okay, which, which is the uh, initial value, times it by 100, and that gave him 91.3. Now, I got 91.3, but I had a negative sign in front of it, um, suggesting that, the, that there was a, a decrease in percent, okay. Um, I think it's best to do it the way I've done it because then the equation can be used for percentage increase and decrease uh, as well. Okay, uh, part um, five then. Uh, the inhibitor competes with the substrate. Uh, the inhibitor binds to or fits to the active site. Uh, with inhibitor bound, the substrate is unable uh, to bind or there are less enzyme substrate complexes formed. Uh, the inhibitor is the same stroke complementary shape as the substrate. And lastly there, this is uh, something I've discussed in other questions, the greater the concentration of substrate, uh, the less inhibition. Okay, competitive inhibitors can have their effect reduced by adding more uh, or a higher concentration of substrate. Okay, and lastly then, uh, it's just the um, iron sulfate added to uh, toothpaste there. You could have had mouthwash or sugary drinks. Uh, that is iron sulfate added to sugary drinks. Okay, okay that's the end of uh, question six.